So to introduce myself, I am currently the engineering manager of a distribution team. It sounds fancy. It's really not fancy. It means you get blamed for everything that goes wrong, and you have no power to influence uh, anything, basically. Um, but uh, the topic today is GitLab. So I do wonder, how many of you know about GitLab? Whoa, that is awesome. I'm so happy about that. So I don't have to then give you the marketing pitch. I can just quickly let you know that GitLab now is no longer just a source code management tool. You get a continuous integration built into it. You also get continuous de uh, deployment. And finally, once you have everything ready and running, you can monitor the changes that your code made to your environment. Marketing pitch over. So how did GitLab start? GitLab did start in 2011 as an open source project um, focused on source code management, namely with Git. The fox you see here, by the way, the angry looking thing that looks at you, is contributed by an, uh, contributed uh, in 2011, 12. And it was a thing that, that we were proud about for some four years before we received some notifications that after the whole day looking at GitLab interface and seeing that logo in the corner looking at me every single minute, I'm having nightmares. Can you guys do something about that? I mean, I cannot work like that. Um, and we ended up agreeing with it, uh, so we had to change it in 2015. Um, the reason why Dimitri started this project was he couldn't really use the tools that were there at that time. 2011, GitHub. Like, that's basically it. Uh, his company would not allow their code to leave their premises, so he had to use the tools that were there. And that was not a fun experience for him. So a couple of weekends, a couple of long working days, and he hacks something together, pushes it out, pushes it out to GitHub, says, this is going to be open source. If someone uses it, uses it, fine. Uh, the problem with if someone uses it means that someone will actually end up using it. And within one year, he had multiple contributors pinging him for help. How do I set this up? I need this. And in 2012, uh, Cice Seibrandi recognized that the open source community around this project is growing. And there might be a way to monetize this. So he created a company called GitLab.com. I know, not inventive, really, but hey. Um, what's also not inventive was the logo he created. I really dislike this thing strongly. Luckily, he did as well, so he retracted it very, um, very uh, fast. So we are here, 2018, and six years after that, the company had 45 million in uh, venture capital funding uh, with the companies like Google Ventures. Um, more than 100,000 companies are using GitLab. And in independent reviews uh, from uh, Forrester, uh, GitLab CI got um, declared the best CI product. The company as well grew to 260 people. And this is, by the way, the number that was valid last week, we are now already at 280, which is, I, I, I don't know, I cannot follow anymore how many people we have. Um, and we are spread all around the world, around 36 countries um, around the world. So I can talk about GitLab for hours, but there are a couple of things that I find really special and why I think we are uh, applicable to this conversation here. So first of all, we have no offices. You saw 36 locations, but we have zero offices in any of those locations. And 
Special thing number two, the one that I really, really like, is everything is open. So not only the code, but everything we do is in the open. So to actually get you to the point where you understand why we are doing certain things like we are doing them now, um, I will jump through time a bit. I will go in the past like I did with a short intro. Um, and if I start jumping too much, you let me know. Uh, and if you don't follow anymore, you also let me know, obviously. So 2012, I'm not going to go all the way back to 2011 because I gave you enough uh, details about that. Um, oh, and by the way, when I was preparing for this talk, I was shocked to, under to, to realize that this was in 2012. Like, it feels like yesterday. I don't know about you guys, but it feels like last yesterday. Um, 2012, August, uh, Sitze comes to, um, well, comes to the office, which means he calls me. We were working together at that time and says, I just found out about a really cool project. I think I can make this into a business. Uh, do you want to work with me on that? It's a startup, right? So whatever idea comes up, you as a developer come and say, like, oh, yeah, let me see. OK, the stack I know, it's Ruby on Rails. Oh, well, let's give it a go. Um, 2012, already by the end of the year, Dimitri joined the company as well as a creator of the project. Um, the problem, though, was we were living all across Europe. Sitsa was living here in Utrecht. I was living at that point in Novi Sad in Serbia, Serbia, not Siberia, Serbia. Um, and Dimitri was living in uh, Kharkiv, which is in Ukraine, basically Russia almost. And our day at the office looked a bit different than what you're used to. There were three of us, obviously. We had no commute. That might come as a shock to you guys, right? But 2,000 kilometers every day traveling here and there doesn't really appeal to us. We had a team call. Every morning, the three of us would jump on a hangout and discuss the day. The day meant what issue or what problem or what thing are we trying to resolve that day. We would discuss it in depth and say, OK, now that we have a clear idea what we are going to do, let's go and implement it. Next day, what did we do? Did we accomplish things? And so on. Um, being the open source project that GitLab is, the project was on GitHub, which is a time, which, it was a tiny bit weird, but it makes sense because that's where the networking is, all right? That's where the network effect comes into play. Um, we did all our development on our private uh, env environment, which I'll refer to as .org. Why? Well, Dimitri created the devgitlab.org, and we were like, OK, well, let's use that. Um, and we did run gitlab.com at that time, um, and it was open to everyone. Everyone could join the, the platform. And it was running the same code that was on our development environment, with the only difference is that our development environment was running a nightly build, while GitLab.com was running a version software that any of the community member would run. What we didn't realize at that time, though, that even just the smallest iteration can make a difference. So we jumped to 2013, and we are at four employees. Another person joined the company. Um, we still didn't have a commute, apart from that one person who lived in Amsterdam, which meant he is close enough to actually commute to the office in Utrecht, the office being a room uh, in Sitze's apartment or house. Um, and they did it only like once a week, so not really a real commute. We still had the team call, now with four of us, but already at that point, we realized GitLab.com, as it was, as it was uh, intended to be a business model that will be a competitor to github.com, it's not really going to work. And we started being approached by people who said, like, can I pay you? Can I pay you to implement this? Please implement this and um, make it available to everyone. I don't care. I just want this feature. So while 
that sounds fun that you cannot really charge the amount of money uh, sometimes that you need to develop a feature. Um, but when companies started approaching us and saying, like, hey, we love GitLab, we run it on our own infrastructure, but we missed this, we realized, OK, this might be the break we were looking for. So we created the Enterprise Edition. Community Edition, completely open source. Enterprise Edition, proprietary code. We also had to switch around how we run our environments. Our private development environment still Community Edition um, to make sure obviously, that the core product is in shape. And GitLab.com would run Enterprise Edition because we want to have more features available to everyone. But there were some problems there already. You know, like when you sit in a meeting where you're not really interested in a topic, you often ask yourself, like, what, what, why, why am I here? Like, what am I doing here? And they're paying me to sit here? Like, I don't understand. Um, already with four people, that became more apparent. It's really hard to have a conversation between four people, especially when you're not sitting next to each other so you can whisper. Um, so we made a decision then and there. It makes no sense to spend that much time um, discussing things when we could discuss something more fun, like, what did you do yesterday? What is your interest? And we switched our team call from too informal, so no work talk. We can mention, like, hey, this is interesting to know if you want to know. But other than that, just talk about your day. Um, following what's happening around uh, in a project that is fast developing um, means that you need to write things down. And we decided, let's use our product to write the things we need to develop the product. So we started using GitLab issues. And we used that, or we did that, on .org. And at that point, we already started having paying customers, which meant private conversations had to move from email to something more manageable. And we started using Zendesk. So you might be wondering, this is like not all that interesting so far. But things are speeding up. And 2014, a super interesting year for us, we are jumping to 2015. 2014 meant that we had more people join the company. We got accepted into Y Combinator. Um, that was the end of 2014. And that meant also that all of us were going to the mecca of technology, right? The valley. And obviously, that's why the picture, right? That's not us. I don't know if you know. Um, but what is interesting about that photo, though, is we were exactly like that. It was spooky watching that and us sitting at the table just like that with a person sitting in the corner because they didn't want to sit on the same desk. And if you haven't seen the show, I do urge you to take a look at it. The first two seasons are eerily uh, uh, applicable to what's happening there. Like the exaggeration in the show, maybe 10% in the first two seasons. Like, unbelievable. So this is us. Three months, one location. We still didn't have a commute. We did live in that house there. Doesn't look that much for standards here. But that house is like over $2 million if you were to buy it. The mountain view is insane. Uh, we didn't have commute. So we were staying at one place. We were working in the living room, sleeping in the bedrooms. We really didn't have the commute apart from when we wanted to get out of the house. And trust me, three months with eight guys in one house, you do want to leave the house. Absolutely. So all of us got really fit. Everyone was going to the gym every day, to the pool, just everywhere apart from the house. But that's not the topic of this conversation. We did have to have a team call. So you might wonder, why are you having a team call? You're sitting in the same room, in the same house. Well, one of our engineers couldn't join us. So it was eight of us in the valley, one person here in Amsterdam. So to stay in touch with the person, 
eight of us would put headphones, connect to the laptop, and talk with the person. Uh, he was our window of sanity to the real, real world. He would tell us about his day, and one person of eight of us would say, like, this was our day. But all jokes aside, we had major scaling problems already at nine people. First of all, when you have that many people, you can't follow anything anymore. Too many conversations going on. The project, the complexity of the project was increasing. In 2014, we introduced GitLab CI, which was the third project that we had to maintain. So maintaining three projects on two environments, which are all related somehow, skyrocketed the maintenance, the expense, the, the, the mental uh, requirement of all of us to know where everything is. What is private? What is public? That org is private, but we are having interactions with our community on uh, github.com. Our customers are in Zendesk. You can't mention their names anywhere. So how do you make sense of all of that? And one thing that really did shock us is, for some reason, investors do expect an office. I, I don't know. I think it's more like, OK, I'm giving you money, and you give me something in return, and that office is something in return. So we had to make some decisions, decisions that were not really that easy. Moving the open source project from github.com to gitlab.com, a platform that is that wasn't that widely used at two, in 2015 was a major decision for us. But that also meant that all of our development could move to GitLab.com. So we moved from the private environment to a public environment and from a public environment to another public environment, but all in one location. So we didn't have to think about hey, where do I raise an issue? Like, do I do it on .org or on .com? And what can I say and what I can't say? And we did two other major decisions, and I'm going to cover them um, next here. We had to consolidate the projects. It was a major decision because while we were doing the pitch, pitches to uh, investors, some of them were jokingly saying, you know, you're giving out a product for free to everyone. Why don't you just give away Enterprise Edition as well? That makes no sense. And usually when they say something like that, there is like, ha-ha after that. But that made us think as well. Um, what are we actually trying to accomplish by having an enterprise edition, right? Well, we want to have customers pay us money so that we can finance the open source product, and so on and so on, right? But if you think about it, you as a customer had to contact us via email or Zendesk to get access to the project that was completely closed off, so you do not know what's happening there. And we would then have to add you to the project so that you can clone the project. And then you, as a customer, talk with us through email, and then we refer you to an issue that we created and tell you, OK, this is where the discussion is going to happen. Furthermore, the fact that something is closed source does not mean that it's going to be secret. Not at all. We had customers accidentally pushing, accidentally pushing GitLab Enterprise Edition to public repositories. And when we thought about that a bit further, we realized if someone wants to go around our restrictions, which were not that difficult to go around, um, they have no problems. But we are making it really hard for people who actually want to give us money, want to get that ease of use. We're making it more difficult for them. So we decided how about we make sure that our Community edition is the core of everything, which it is, open source. But the part that is encompassing the community edition is also publicly accessible. So enterprise edition became open core, meaning you see the source code, you can see what's happening there, but you do need a license to use it. 
And yes, you might be wondering, well, why would I then need a license? Well, you know, like if you want to go around that, if you want to pirate software, you can, absolutely. But try running that in a company that cares about legal things. It's going to be a bit more difficult. So you want to pirate the code? Go ahead, pirate it. But what about the investors? The investors that, that say, like, hey, I'm going to give you money, you give me an office. Well, the three months in one house made us realize we do not want to be in one place. We do not appreciate that we are put in one location and we were supposed to be more um, efficient. I didn't want to live in the US. A couple of my other colleagues didn't, others did want to, but we could hire everyone in the location where they are or where they want to be. And what we also realize is investors actually do not care about owning something. They just care about money in general. So how about we save that money by not paying hundreds and thousands of dollars a year for an office and saving on the commute costs. Commute costs, not, not necessarily having to be the money you spend on a commute. But for a lot of you, probably it's true that you're sitting in a rush hour every day, two times a day, or in a train trying to be effective while someone is standing on your head, right? And we realized also that we can make someone's life better in the location where they want to be by just paying better. You know, like if you want to live in, in Ukraine, in Serbia, you can, and you are going to comp compete with uh, IT there, but if you pay higher rates than, uh, than what the going rate is, you're going to get the person, especially when you tell them you don't have to come to an office. So at this point, you might be wondering, how are we actually doing? How are we doing and how are we getting stuff done? I mentioned this a couple of times. And I'm going to mention it a couple of more times. All our code, all our issues, all our plans are public. So everyone can look that up, see what we are going to do next, why we are going to do that, and consider maybe changing our plan. We had customers saying, you know, if you give us a discount, we would love to have this feature, and we have the power to contribute. And our developers do want to work on something that is at least close to open source, if not open source. So give us a discount. We'll do this feature for you. And they contribute to a proprietary product. Companies that do not give out that power that easily. They usually own everything the developer makes while working for the company. We also make sure, made sure that the contribution process for everyone wanting to contribute to anything GitLab is the same whether you work for GitLab or not. And we have over 1,900 contributors. That number goes up every day. Like right now, it went up probably by one. I don't expect it to be that uh, fast. But um, this is only for the community edition. Like, we are not counting the number of times someone contributed something to our proprietary project or to our website or to all of the various projects that we have. And what we also realized was being open is incredibly powerful. So this came from two incidents that I can remember. One of them was in the early days of GitLab. Um, I was at pager duty, or rather at uh, escalation path at that time, which meant something happens on gitlab.com, I get woken up at 3 a.m. So I get woken up at 3 a.m., go online, gitlab.com, this site can be reached. Wow, okay. Process for us at that point was open up a Google Doc and try to figure out what's happening. So that's what I did. Started pasting you know, output of the logs and trying to understand what's happening completely, not knowing anything that's happening, obviously. 
Um, at that point, my colleague joins me as well, and the two of us are trying to make sense of millions of lines of logs. When uh, Sitze comes in and tells us, how are you going? How are you doing? Bad. Do you need help? Yes, but you're not going to help us, obviously. And he's like, yeah, but we can ask for help. Who do we ask for help? Like, it's two of us. Oh, how about you ask for the whole community? So he says, you have two minutes to go through everything you wrote here, make sure that there is nothing sensitive there, like a password or whatever. And in two minutes, I'm going to tweet about this, give the link to the document, open it up to public, and see if someone pitches in. Within one minute of the tweet, we had 50 people looking at the document and suggesting, hey, maybe you should try this. Oh, this is what happened at my GitLab instance. Take a look at this. And I'm not saying that that was the reason why the site got back up, but it definitely helped us out. The second one, you probably, if you are a developer, you probably have heard of this. Last year, February, RMRF database uh, is something that one of our developers did. So what usually happens in situations like this, you go to Twitter of that product or the, the status page, and you get, we are experiencing technical difficulties, right? Then 12 hours later, we are still working on resolving te technical difficulties. And all the while, you're thinking, oh my god, can you give me something more than that? Because I, I need to work because I'm using your product. So as soon as the RMRF, meaning deleting the database, incident happened, um, the first event clicked in my head already. I was luckily not involved in all of this. but. What, also, well, what did happen was Sisa coming into the office or into the call saying, uh, why is this not public? We want everyone to know what's happening. That is completely something that you do not expect because you want to hide when someone removed the database. But this is where previous talk that Tracy, uh, uh, in the previous talk Tracy mentioned, no bullshit. This is really important. You made a mistake. Own up to it. And within five minutes, we had the um, live stream going up. In my opinion, probably one of the most boring live streams ever. But apparently, a couple of thousand people watching the stream were disagreeing. They were smitten by looking at black screen and things moving very slowly. That was us trying to you know, back, um, restore the database. Um, the, that event, made, uh, with that event, I got unbelievable amount of great feedback. Everywhere I go to any of the meetups, or conferences, wherever I speak, Usually people remember that, hey, we were sitting in our office and we were looking at that and we stopped working because, you know, it's unbelievable that someone said and did exactly what we actually had a couple of years ago, by the way. I have friends that work in, in big companies saying, hey, our department stopped because we were uh, looking at your live stream on the projector in the meeting room and discussing how things work. So. Being open and no bullshit is really powerful. Do not un underestimate that. So from all of these events, we realized if we open the whole company, you can find the information regardless of where you are. But if you go to Handbook, you will find everything about GitLab, right? Handbook page is one place where you will have all of the information that you need to know about the company. Do you want to know how we are making our product decisions? Why are some certain features going here or there? You can go there and take a look there. Uh, if you're a product manager of GitLab, you're, you're going to go there first to find out the information and then go further following the links, right? Do you want to know how much time off we get? Well, the vacation policy is written there. Do you, know, do you want to know how much I earn? 
no longer as a developer, I guess, but if you were a developer in your location, you can go to this page. At the bottom, there is a compensation calculator. Obviously, this is not a precise number you're going to get. You're not going to get it in like one euro, but it's a range. This is something where we are starting from, right? Like this is your location with these various factors. We have San Francisco as the base and a huge formula there. You can find out whether this is something for you. Maybe you want to apply. So everything that can be reasonably open, we default to public. Um, obviously, we can't open everything. Few things, few reasons. Uh, finance, we can't open because uh, our investors are requesting that this information stays uh, private. Security bugs, we first discuss all of those privately and make sure that we have a fix ready, inform people, inform users, um, and then open up the actual discussion. There was another one, but I forgot. See, that's the problem. When you do everything public, you don't think about private anymore. So, hmm. Yeah, licensing information. So, licenses and uh, doing license work with customers, we can't open that because some licenses require everything to be private, which is beyond me, 2018 people. So, because of everything being open, a lot of other people took our ideas and built companies around that. But that is fine. That is fine because ultimately they will go and come back and say, hey, I took, took this, let me contribute something back. Or I need this, can you work with me to get this? And uh, yeah, I've been talking a lot, obviously. But you might be wondering how do we actually get things done, right? So there are a couple of things that make all of this possible. First of all, we work async. Like you saw previously, we are all over the world. And making sure that everything is written down is in the core of this. So if you have everything written down, in a year time, someone can come in, take a look at your issue that you created, your merge request, your whatever and say, oh, this is why you were making this decision. Well, you know, it's 2018, we no longer need this. Can we reopen this discussion and continue from there? You do not lose the value of sitting in a meeting, losing yourself in your thoughts, and then getting the final product, and then answering the same question over and over again to people who come back later and ask, like, why did you make this decision? Then you have to think back, and it doesn't work like it doesn't work really well when you need to think back. Writing everything down means that you have to have a single source of truth, because if you write everything down and it's all over the place, it's useless. For us, it's the handbook that I mentioned. So whenever you do not know where to find something, you go to handbook, and then you follow your steps, right? OK, I'm in engineering, so I go to engineering. And then, oh, I need to find the project. I go to engineering projects. And then I see a list of projects. Who is responsible for the project? Oh, yes, that's the person I wanted to ping. So I go and ping that person. This is the help I need, right? We're also not waiting for a consensus. We joke that we are not a democracy. We are a democracy to an extent. But we are not waiting for everyone to give their opinion. Because if everyone gives their opinion, you're not going to get anything done. More than three people in a decision, well, actually, more than two people in a decision is already a problem. But let's say more than three people in one decision, you're never going to get things done. So what we try to do is people who are there they write the decision that they made, and they move with the minimal viable change. So that's the thing you see there. We're not trying to make the perfect car from the scratch, because you're never going to get there. Or if you get there, it's going to be too late. So we try to make wheels and skateboard first. And yes, people might not want to skateboard at the moment, but they're going to take the skateboard and say, OK, but I wanted a car and then we would make it into a scooter. So, oh, well, th this is already better, but I did want the car, ultimately, right? And during that part, someone might actually realize, actually, 
bicycle is enough for me. I don't really need a car. I thought I needed a car, but this, this will do while you're developing your car. This one is extremely important. Everyone has to be able to contribute. So every single person at GitLab makes changes, but every single person that wants to contribute to GitLab can, ma can make changes as well. This is the calendar, contribution calendar for our chief financial officer. And if you have met financial people, you do know that they're not used to developers' tools, right? Like, they don't know what Git is, apart from the dirty word. Um, and they don't really know how to use uh, uh, project management software. But if you simplify things, and if you make sure that uh, people can contribute, even people like chief financial officer of our company can do commits, can write in issues, can create merge requests. You just need to make them aware that they can actually do that. This one is a bit tricky to sell. Freedom to live a better life. Why? Well, how does unlimited vacation policy actually influence you working in the open and you working better? Well, I'll use my example. Last year, out of 12 months, I traveled for 10. Out of those 10 months, I took five days off. I haven't logged a single day um, extra because I felt tired. Um, I would jump into my laptop every single day excited to do something that will change someone's workflow. So making sure that I don't feel that grind, that stress of what's happening at my job is extremely helpful. We don't have set hours. I wake up at 11 sometimes in the morning, not in the evening, and then work for like two hours and then go for lunch, um, go see a movie, then work a couple of hours in the evening. That's also one of the reasons why I don't feel tired, because that's my clock. My clock is not forcing, like, it does not allow me to wake up at 7 a.m. Honestly, I get shocked that there is a world at 6 a.m. I don't understand how can people even get up that early. It's not humane, people. We only make sure that you do deliver results. So whether you use one hour to write a complex thing or a simple thing, or you use four hours, is what matters. But no one is going to be over your head and say, like, OK, well, now, Hey, it's four hours. Why didn't you deliver this? It doesn't work like that. And to make sure that we are actually a company, we spend a lot of time bonding. You remember that I mentioned the team call that went from talking about work to informal. Well, now at almost 300 people, we are still using the team call as a thing that allows us to bond. I know what my colleague does in his free time, what his hobbies are. And we have people explaining how their hobbies are progressing. So every week you would hear, hey, OK, so now I build this, and this is how it works. And you actually feel like you're getting involved. We also do company trips. So the whole company travels to a location in the world. So this is from our last one. This was in Crete, in Greece, in October. And we traveled a year before that to Mexico, where we spent a week together. And it's not something that you might have heard, where people say, OK, now we are sitting in a meeting room, and we are discussing um, policies and what are our next steps. It doesn't work like that. Because we are async, it, may, it, may, it means that we need to write everything down. Why do you need a full office of people writing everything down? Like we, you can do that at home. So we spent that time bonding, going to excursions, visiting or drinking, to be honest. But um, we do a lot of culture things, right? And we also have um, a travel allowance which means if you want to go 
visit your colleague. You go to the handbook, travel, and then find the allowance, which says if you are going to um, travel for par private reasons to a location where the colleague, your colleague is, you can expense that, or part of that at least. Like you cannot really travel to Australia and they say, okay, well, I saw Sydney, so. But the thing you see on the screen here, um, two of our colleagues actually went on a six-month trip around the world where company paid more than half of their trip by making sure they visit all the places where we have colleagues, or most of the places where we have colleagues. So that means you can trick the system, right? Like you can still travel a lot and work and also get your money back for it. So let me sum up. It's really important if you want to work like this is to communicate async. And if you communicate async, you have to write everything down. I mean everything. N nothing can stay in your head. If you have a meeting, the meeting has to have a conclusion or a discussion written down. If it doesn't have one, everyone is there in their right to ask you, why did you have that meeting? But when you write every do everything down, make sure you have a single source of truth so people can find it. Obviously, make sure you also have a search or a way of searching through that because our handbook is over a thousand pages if you were to print it right now. And everything is up for discussion. And I do mean everything. People have been reopening issues that are four years old asking, can we now revisit this? And we say, yes, let's revisit this. Thank you for listening. Um, <laughs> thanks. I'm uh, open for any questions. And if you are interested in, about, uh, in um, what positions we are hiring for, you can take a look at the jobs page. And my colleague is also um, leading a podcast called Remote Work Podcast, if you want to hear more about that.